welcome everyone. I felt that I was frozen for a little bit and I tried to keep my big smile on while I was sort of frozen. Um, thank you. This is this is really exciting that we have this um, faculty roundtable. I had a chance to meet with them, but I will let me acknowledge our land again. Um, while Lucas mentioned about the indigenous knowledge has been being scripted without acknowledging them, this is a colonial practice. I would like to remind that um, in the Indigenous Protocol and AI position paper that was published in 2019, um, the indigenous community that came around um, that joined together in Hawaii, um, they put a position paper out where they talk about when that we should use generative AI to think about when, when we are using it, we need to think about how, what is the impact on our land, on our nature. Um, it's not just using AI to help us help us, meaning the human being. Um, when human being exists because we have the nature um, around us. So think about the environmental impact that generative AI has around us. And also think about how we can use generative AI to make our world a better place. That's a very high order, as I'm saying it. I'm scared. Um, but I think, as Alyssa mentioned earlier, that we are in the, we are in this, in the education space. This is our job. Educator needs to think about what education will look like in 15 years, maybe in two years. What is the classroom going to look like? And I'm just very excited that um, we have get, gathered together a amazing pet. Um, group of panelists. Um, we have Celeste, and I'm, I'm going to ask my colleague to help me spotlight them, and I will turn off the slide back so you can see who they are. Say hello to them. We have Celeste um, from Botany, Donwook, Carly, Halima, and William. And I will be the moderator, but I told them that they do not need to follow my structure. We we have a group, little group huddle, as you mentioned, um, may notice, but they do not need to follow my structure. And this is the structure here. Um, we will we we initially, and as you notice on the event registration, um, description, we thought about four roundtable um questions, um, assessment in, we imagined. Um, what is it going to look like? How is it going to trans transform our ass assessment? How can we balance fairness and innovation? Then we will move on the integration into teaching practice. How is it going to affect our teaching practice? Um, and how can we provide personalized feedback? And at the same time, we don't want to forget about creativity. How can we continue to foster students' creativity and their independent th thinking? Our last question is a little big. When we met last week, we go, well, this is a huge, big question, but we know it's going to come up. Um, so uh, we will. We hope that the structure will finish in about 30 minutes. And then we really want to open the floor for lots of questions, um, discussions, we welcome you to chime in, um, ask our questions. So we set up a Slido account and um, use the Slido when you want to submit the questions for our panelists. Um, but feel free to use the chat to chat with each other. Um, it will be really busy and I'm a little worried that I may not be able to follow, but I will at the end, uh, we will save the chat. We will have a time, chance to, to look at them later. But if you really want any questions to our panelists, please put it in the Slido account. And um, just before we start, we really want to let everyone know that we are not the expert in large language model. Um, but we, the panelists, know a little bit about what is happening in the discipline that Alyssa mentioned earlier. Like we know what's happening in the field. So, so let's say 
She doesn't know much about AI, but she knows about teaching. Just like many of us do. Okay, science writing has converged on the acknowledgement of AI use, but we still cannot list AI as author. So this may tell us a little bit more about that um, in her classroom. So the students can use AI to develop ideas and writing. Don Wood. Um, Don Wood is a faculty member from computer science. And there's just so much that is happening in his field um, because he studies social and human science of the interaction between human, AI, human and AI. So again, he is going to let us know more during his time. Um, Ali Ma is a faculty member from the Master of Education Technology program. And learning analytics helps using machine learning algorithm can help students um, broaden the application in the field. And it's not really new. And something pops up on my screen. Um, and Hanuma is going to tell us more what is happening in education. Kari um, is a sessional lecturer, um, instructor in the Sauter School of Business. And she really is, she's really curious to know the mindset of teachers in the education system. And she's here telling us what she's thinking too. And William um, and has been using it to assist in writing and thinking about using protein variants and how to cure disease causing mutations and all that and I, I when I see protein I have to say that I get really excited myself because that's the science in the scientists in me that I also used to study protein myself so I wanted to know the latest now that I've left the field of science um, protein structure I would love to hear more from him so again slido.com for questions and this is the code we will continue to have the code at the, in, at the corner of the slide throughout the session so I am just going to just want to let everyone know um, the panelists met briefly last week and during our discussions, we there's a few things that we would like to share um, that's not on the event description. Um, we really want to continue to, uh, to talk about um, generative AI, the promises, some of the risk, the car wheels that we can set in our classroom, in our education environment. Um, how does the advert of generative AI mean to the philosophy of education? We want to talk about that, but we may also want to join the philosopher's corner tomorrow or later during the symposium. Um, some of the practical guides that we would like to share too um, about the use in the content creation or the creations and in our classroom practice and something about teaching and assessment. So we talked a lot last week and I asked my panelists, please keep the same energy that we had last week and open to you. And these are the four questions. And we will start with the first question and I, and then I will turn off my slide share. Um, first questions, and I would like to invite Silas and Halima to respond to this. How does generative AI transform skills and knowledge assessment while balancing fairness and innovation. So Liz, Halimat, over to you. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go first for a few minutes. Um, so I'm in biology and the short answer to this, I think for me is that it hasn't changed much at all. Um, I am here Mostly, I think, because I was a super early adopter of um, AI in my classroom um, as early as sort of first week of January um, when when second semester sort of started. Um, my class, I mean, in, in biology in particular, we're mostly out kind of stomping around in streams and measuring stuff. Um, so when I think about the point earlier of where is that going to be in 15 years, probably we'll still be out stomping around measuring stuff um, in the stream. Um, I do a lot of still, so last term and this term, um, I do quite a bit of introductory use with my students. Um, when I started 
playing with AI. It was mostly just chat GPT at the time, um, last, last December, almost, almost a year ago. Um, and there was immediately a big, um, sort of rift, I think, at least in my, in my field of, of people who were really afraid of, of what, what AI might do and implementing all sorts of, um, screening mechanisms, detectors, that sort of thing. Um, and then there were a few people like me that were generally just curious about what, what this tool um, could do for education and could do in our classrooms. Um, and I was a little bit unsure of how to navigate that, I think. Um, I use, can, can you show the, the next slide, Judy? Um, one of the things that, that I used very early on that was sort of a permission, I think, um, for me, Uh, was this Sarah Eaton's work on tenets of post plagiarism? She does a lot of thinking and um, and and dealing with what writing in particular is going is going to look like with um, with the advent of AI. And for me, this sort of gave me permission to sort of launch ahead with my students and not really worry about all these detection things and things that 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 some of my colleagues were implementing. Um, and so I did. I just jumped in and. Um, spent some time at that point, only one, believe it or not, only one of my hundred students um, had actually used chat GPT before and most of them hadn't and had no idea what was um, what was happening. So we, we worked together for a while sort of building some um, guidelines. And then the other slide I want to show is their um, comments at the end of the term. So this was very unscientific. Um, a commentary. What happened was I was invited to give my first talk on using AI in the classroom, right as the term was ending, and it hadn't really I hadn't really considered getting feedback from students. So I literally just passed out paper towels for the people that were there and said, "Tell me what you thought of using this." Um, and these were some of the comments that stood out for me um, that I think have really impacted the way I think about using Chat GPT for my students. Um, mostly their writing, although now some of them are using it to generate ideas too. I mean, to be honest, science writing is not super creative usually. Um, the creative part though is the generating of ideas for my students, which um, it does an okay job with kind of. Um, so a couple ones that I wanted to point out that I think were really accurate and really true is number four, neurodivergent students realizing that um, this kind of levels the playing field in, in some ways, which I think was um, a good a good takeaway for me. Um, in this group of students, about 30% of them chose not to use AI at all in their writing. And I think about that percentage still holds true this term um, for two reasons. One is that they say they want to learn to write on their own and this isn't very helpful. And the second reason is that they feel like it's so much work babysitting the accuracy um, and the redundancy uh, that they just feel like it's not worth the time. So um, probably most of my students, even though they have free access to it, aren't actually using it um, using it much uh, anyway. So I'll pass it over to Alima. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. I think that I agree with you in that I think we should lead with curiosity. Um, in the field of education, there was an uproar. There's a lot of fear. And I think that fear is warranted. These are new tools. They're untested tools. While there's a lot of promise, there are those drawbacks. And I think that you mentioned your neurodiverse student. That's one of them. And making sure that these tools are accessible to our students, that we teach them how to use them, and that we make sure that we're not making learning inaccessible by really putting weight on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, making things inaccessible by shutting things down and um, focusing on the, sorry about that, I have alarm go off, focusing on the um, cheating on, on academic integrity. Um, I think that as time goes on, we're going to be using these tools quite often for cognitive offloading, but we have to teach our students to use them critically. 
Hmm. Yeah, I feel honestly like, at least in my field, it's almost a disservice to not expose my students in to to what it what AI can do, particularly for their writing, because it is becoming more and more of an um, acceptable thing in science publications. So I agree with you that I think that approaching it with curiosity and also um, kind of a responsibility, to be honest, I feel. I find it interesting to talk with our students preemptively about it, to decide, okay, how do we want to use this in this course? Do we want to use it as a coach? You know, so we use it for brainstorming or we use it for pre-writes or things like that. Or, you know, is it okay to use it as a crutch maybe for grammar or organizations of things or kind of somewhere in between? Um, what did, what was the the input from your students after they had had the opportunity to use it in the course? Yeah, I don't. Some some definitely used it a lot um, and still do, and some not so much and are just kind of not not interested. Um, there's a question in the in the chat about um, citing Chat GPT. So initially, at the start of term, there was no guidelines in science at all. This is last term, um, and about March, some of the big science journals, Nature and Science, um, came out with some guidelines on. Um, basically stating people had submitted articles citing chat GPT as an author. And they basically said, you can't do that. They're not accepting it as authorship. You can acknowledge in the acknowledgement section that pieces of this were written by AI or AI was used or something like that. And so that's what we've implemented in my, um, in my course, my students do publish, I should probably state that. So my students, um, all their work is public facing in one way or another. So none of it is constrained just to our class. Um, so it is it is an honest consideration of how they're going to acknowledge that they use ChatGP. And we are, we're, we are following sort of the guidelines of what the big science journals do. So they can't, they don't list um, whatever AI they're using as authors, but they do, um, they do acknowledge that they've used it in their work. Thank you very much, Alma. And so let's end. I'm going to move on to the next question. Donald, are you ready? So this is the questions that we put on our description, um, integrating into teaching. How may we integrate AI into our teaching practice from creating cases to providing personalized feedback? So over to you. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, answering this question at the capacity of researcher studying how AI, especially generative AI, uh, and particularly the language, large language model uh, of ChatGPT, a kind, can be integrated into uh, educational practices. I am maybe most well known for studying that aspect of human AI interaction in the field. And um, I can comment on the speculative promises and also the risks regarding when the practitioner actually em embrace uh, AI into their teaching. And also I have allowed my student in computer science 344, uh, Introduction to Human Computer Interaction to actually use uh, ChatGPT or any AI tools in their, uh, in their coursework. So I have gathered some survey data to get a sense of what's happening in them. So I can comment on uh, my uh, my experience uh, regarding this question as well. So this question, if you still remember, actually has two uh, components in it. One is how are we gonna integrate these kind of new AI, powerful AI tools into the teaching practices? And second is about personalization. I think they are relevant, but also orthogonal. So I would like to break down those into a uh, separate uh, thread of conversation. So integration, is a very important issue to think about. And here, what we mentioned is integration, not just about fighting against ChatGPT, uh, as Celeste mentioned, about more and more integrative approach and embracing, embracing attitude. Uh, and also, it's not just the uh, 
um, you know, mindless allowance of letting students use ChatGPT and then see what's going, uh, what's going on. And actually, the latter approach, really relaxed approach, is actually what's happening in many UBC classrooms, as I heard. Like the instructor actually has no leverage to control how students are using it, so they just allow and then see what's happening. Uh, but I see there's a bit of risk in doing so as well. Um, so then, what is integration, I think. Um, so if if you want to distinguish integration from the other end of spectrum, I think you can think about your educational endeavor in two different ways. One, uh, what's going to happen is a AI uh, independent learning that should happen in students learning. And the other is AI integrated learning that should happen, which is contrasting to AI uh, independent learning. I also call AI independent learning as AI invariant learning too. Um, and just giving you an example for you to understand what these two concepts are, um, you can think of introduction of calculator in you know, about 80s and 70s, right? Calculator was a very useful tool. Everybody knew that it's gonna be a tool that's gonna be used in professional settings. So we have to teach students how to use it for arithmetic tasks, but also it you know, raises concern and debate about you know, how we're gonna teach arithmetic to students. So when it comes to calculator, there is a AI, no, there's a calculator invariant learning that, that there should happen. Students should learn how to do addition, like arithmetic, basic arithmetic, and know the concept, right? But also there's contrastly calculator integrated learning approach that you have to teach how to use calculator for their actual you know, task that is relevant to their professional job in the future. And I think the similar parallel exists in AI domain too. Why? Because um, AI use is very predominant in the professional setup already. For example, code generator, about 80% of the coder, like software engineers are already using um, uh, AI-based software generation tool, code generation tool like Copilot. Um, and it just has become part of their everyday tool. You know, uh, coder use, um, you know, this integrated developed environment and they're existing like code generating plugins so they can just type in the code a little bit and then just give you the whole function or whole file set that they can run and test. So um, um, it, it, it's becoming already part of the reality. The same for the writing tasks, the same for many other tasks that you can imagine. Uh, also going beyond the language, uh, there's an issue of image generation, or decision making as well. So we have to teach them how to use it. So I'd like to highlight the importance of distinguish between these two concepts, AI invariant learning and AI integrated learning. And more so, it's not just about those two concepts. The instructor should envision what they're gonna teach gonna be relevant or not, or how it can change in the new world of where the AI use is gonna be normalized because well, we are living in a capitalistic society and these AI tools are essentially working as a productivity booster. And that's why there's so many hype about it. Uh, I'm, I'm saying this with recognizing all the uh, side effects and also concerns and risks of, of those capitalistic endeavor and uh, corporate greed, which is super concerning too. But well, there's a trend uh, and I, I think it's gonna be the technical trend to embrace those um, further on in the professional job. Um, I think maybe I spent too much time on integration. If I'm gonna mention something about personalization, um, I would say if generative AI gonna be, uh, gonna make a big impact on education, it's gonna be because of the personalization. And this is a thought based on not the recent trend, but actually an old study called the Bloom's Two Sigma study. Um, do people aware what Bloom's Two Sigma problem is? Um, it's it's a study from '86 uh, where Benjamin Bloom, who is you know maybe one of the most famous educational researcher, um, education researcher, um, yeah, and uh, and he tested 
he compared the performance of students in a traditional like one to many classroom where a student, uh, an instructor teaching 40 students or something and compared student performance in the one-on-one -on -one, like learning uh, in, in a mastery learning context too. And what Bloom identified is that if you can offer to a student of a similar quality, similar talent, if you can offer individualized learning, not the one too many, then their performance can increase by two sigma of the population, which means uh, on average students in one-on-one -on -one learning gonna beat 98% of the student in a big classroom, right? The same students can get A plus or A zero while they can do average in traditional learning. And these length learning tools are actually serving as a tutor or instructor or teaching agent. Um, of course, currently technology is not perfect and it has any, many issues like hallucination, factual errors, and also over dependency issue. Those need to be addressed. I believe companies are gonna work on addressing them. Uh, but if that happens, then there's a hope that it can reduce a lot of work for the inst instructors and, and provide higher quality education, personal education to the students uh, with that promise. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Donwood, for sharing. Donwood's sentence is very long. I've been trying to <laughs> stop him because we still have to listen to the next two panelists. Thank you, Donwood. For, for, um, I have a lot to think about because there's something that he talked about what we are going to teach in the classroom when it become normalized. I really, I don't teach until the summer. I still have a few months to think about this. Um, but next, um, let me share my screen so that you can see the questions coming up. So we are going to look into creativity. I think this is the most exciting part for me. Um, again, I haven't really thought about it as a science scientist. Um, so come up next, we will have William and Kari and how may we foster students' creativity and in the, in the independent thinking when we have all these tools, when AI can do so much individualized learning for us, with us. Over to you, William and Kari. Great. Kari, right, would you like to go first on this one? Sure, I can kick off. Um, this is a fun question for me to, to respond to. So I I teach a course called Creativity. It's a required course in many of the graduate programs at Sauter. Um, and j just a quick amendment to what Judy said, I'm a full-time lecturer, not a, not a sessional, and the group lead of the law and business communications team at Sauter, but also uh, do educational design work uh, as, a, as a consultant outside of UBC. Um, so my PhD is actually in, in design and, and how design and systems intersect with um, educational spaces and how we can enact our creativity within, within those spaces. So when I think about creativity with students, um, I first flip the question to myself and I, and I pose it to, to colleagues, like what is our relationship to our own creativity as educators? what do we currently deem creative in our classrooms and how does AI um, and the emergence of generative AI both uh, assist or really challenge uh, the grooves and the habits we're in in, in, in our own creative work. Uh, so I, I wonder questions around trust are really interesting to me when I think about creativity. Um, do I trust myself with it? Do we trust our colleagues with it? Uh, because faculty are using it quite a bit too. <laughs> uh, do we trust our students with it? Do we trust students at all? Uh, do we trust the people who created it? Uh, do we trust our information in it? So I mean, so much of how we get into um, places and spaces of flow and creative process, both with students and ourselves are bound in, in questions about trust. Um, I often think that our relationship to our disciplines and to the topics that we are uh, scholars in um, are like our own personal love stories. <laughs> you know, we have to really fall in love with our discipline. We have to fall in love with our craft. We have to fall in love with the topics that we that keep us up at night. And 
in you know December of 2022 for me, um, AI and generative AI emerged and had a seat at the table. And even now I sort of symbolically have always an empty chair in my classroom to kind of have a physical presence of there is something else in the room with us. It is not a machine, it is people who have created this amazing, this amazing thing that it is there, it's ubiquitous whether we want it to be or not. And do we see that in our disciplines as a betrayal? Do we see it as a new chapter of our love story? Uh, who are our students in that story? What are they writing alongside us in the story of our disciplines? Um, and how do we really start to push past the us them dialectic that we often get into with students and instead think about we together as a community of novice to expert scholars with this sort of empty chair in the room with us that we're all trying to decide whether it should be there or not. So for me, that's where creative process starts, those types of conversations. And um, I'll, I'll just end with saying that I had a student recently tell me that in the creativity course that I taught, he came back and said, I think the thing that we did the most in the classroom that is helpful with AI is um, we came at conversations from a mindset of courage and optimism and that to be creative in this time, you know, with everything going on, so much going on in the world, um, it requires immense amounts of courage and optimism. And the definition of creativity, according to scholarship, is that it is the production of something that is both novel and useful. Um, so I'm courageously and optimistically trying to find utility in this very novel thing uh, because it's there and it's something that I need to I need to work with. But I do still think as scholars in the academy, we're debating its utility. We're debating and um, getting quite personal and critical of each other about whether we believe it's useful, uh, but it is novel. Thanks very much, Kari. So, by way of introduction, I believe that there's a philosophical essence to things. Uh, and pedagogy and teaching and learning is one of the things for which there is indeed a philosophical essence. Now, uh, I'm a, a medical geneticist by training. Um, I solve rare genetic diseases as best I can and do my best to diagnose patients with the strangest, weirdest diseases that are out there. Diseases that don't necessarily even exist in textbooks yet when I'm called upon to diagnose them and when many of my colleagues are called upon to diagnose them. Now, in my capacity as an educator, I have taught the graduate course uh, for medical genetics uh, that includes an in-depth discussion of the human genome and its structure. Of course, we have assignments as part of that course that students had to produce written essays that discuss a, a scientific topic. Now, the challenge then is, of course, marking those essays, essays and trying to uh, have my own understanding of what the student's understanding is. The challenges that I have with uh, generative AI in that context is that I think we can all imagine the optimal way that AI might be used. And I, you know, kudos to Halima for highlighting that, that it can be used if, crit if used critically, where the students are really thinking about the text that they're, that they're generating and uh, thinking about the ideas behind it, the science behind it, the actual causality behind the, the what they are asserting in their discussion of a scientific topic. However, it is very often not used optimally. Every Everything that I've read about generative AI, at least in this early generation, has suggested to me that a significant proportion of users basically use it to scrape what's out there, produce something one could argue it's novel or one could argue it's derivative, right? Something very close to average and often below average and submit that simply as a time saver. So I, I think that we do need to have these kinds of conversations about what is the nature of the assignments that we give to students and what is actually the nature of the assessment. 
Is the point of me asking a student to write an essay to have the product? Is it to have the essay at the end? I mean, not really. The, 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 the point of that exercise is to produce the novel understanding in the student's mind, not only of how to write, but how to think. And, and, and I, I see uh, writing for an audience as in many ways the highest form of thinking because you really have to get your thoughts in order, decide what message that you, what the message is that you want to get across and make sure that that is actually intelligible to the audience. So that's my, that's my contribution. I invite questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you all the panelists and I'm going to spotlight you all. Um, I know I gave you a very short amount, I gave you, I assigned you a very short amount of time to speak and I actually cut you off too. Um, but now the floor is open. Um, you can respond to each other. We also have questions on Slido and I also see some this has started um, responding to, in the chat too. Um, yeah, Helena, may I ask you to expand and elaborate on what is out there oh i was just responding to william's comment that i think oh, it's yeah. really important because the students are taking this text from chat 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 gpt and they hopefully before they employ what's written think about where that data came from Right, because we have to think about the language corpus and what's there, and a lot hasn't been written. We have to look at those voices, and right now, Chat GPT doesn't really tell us the provenance of the data. So we really need to consider that before we use this output that's produced for us. Um, if I can build on that, Helena, so the ways that I bring it into my classroom is as a tool in process rather than a um, invitation for folks to use it for final output or final product. So, I, I mean, I'm not naive. They probably are using it in the crafting of final assignments, but those are also um, not as heavily weighted as, as process pieces. So that I find is, allows me to have it in the room with me to be able to start to pose those challenging questions that you're asking like what what is this data where is this data coming from and to stay you know in that space of curiosity that you you really um set a lovely foundation at the beginning of your introduction around how do we just stay in that place of curiosity um because i'm very curious about that data set but also curious about the mindset that we have that this has been a built and crafted and created thing. It's not a sort of neutralized digital source somewhere. <laughs> so if we bring it into, if we bring it in as a process tool, for example, you know, think pair share, you know, think pair, pair with AI, go back to pair, then share and ask some like key questions in that process there's a criticality we can come at in a way that it can be in the room that isn't about just always about the other AI, which is academic integrity of a, of a, of a submitted document. So that's, that's, that's one place where I really come at that data source piece and what, what's behind, what's behind. Wouldn't it be great if chat GPT-5 told us where the data came from? That kind of acknowledgement would be amazing. And I think that's one piece of explainable AI that we haven't talked about yet is just crediting the people, you know, whose data is being used and perhaps to even involve them in the conversation of do they want it there? Do they want it in the aggregate? You know, looking at um, we're decolonate, decolonizing so much of our curriculum, it would be interesting to see how we decolonize these large language models. I'm just trying to catch up on the questions in the chat. Yeah, 
we have a lot of questions. So let's, um, I noticed that you unmuted yourself earlier. I let you go, but I also have questions about how do you check your students that book? And that, what, you mentioned that, yes. Um, you mentioned that you're going oh, to ch lab. check it. Yeah, the lab book. Yes. The lab notebooks. Um, lab notebooks are still paper, pen on paper, um, because of all sorts of considerations in a physical um, lab, safety considerations and elsewise. Um, so before a student leaves the lab every week, they bring their notebook to our TAs, to the TAs, um, and they sort of scan through, make sure that the students have um, completed all the things they have to complete in their lab notebooks, um, which are more, uh, sort of open form. There's not prescribed things they have to complete, but they have to have their methods and materials, their data um, collection, and then they write a reflection at the end of each lab. Um, and then they get a sticker in their lab, lab notebook and that um, signals to us that they were there and participated that week. Does that answer that? And then three times we actually collect them for the week and the TAs actually read through much more diligently and provide um, feedback. So that's sort of, sort of a special thing in, in science. I wouldn't expect that to be um, a broadly applicable thing, but um, that's really the nut and bolts of understanding what's happening in science more than their writing is. I was, I unmuted myself because I wanted to um, address this comment question that Tu made, which I thought was interesting about um, AI enhancing our compre comprehension of the broader world beyond our immediately immediate physical classroom environment, which I think is um, a really interesting um, point. And I don't know. I mean, I don't really have much to say about that. I just wanted to um, throw that out there. That I think that's a good that's a good question. No, we, I don't know if you know this, but I have a questions on Slido that I think you may have something to say about that. Um, it's related to uh, calculators. So on uh, one of the Slido questions, um, the person said, um, calculator has have little to do with humanities learning and teaching, but chat GPT is transformative in each and every aspect. Are they comparable? Of course, they're not. Yeah, of course not. Um, calculator was a metaphor that I used to help you imagine the relationship between the core component that you want to teach in your course versus what you have to facilitate them to so they can integrate AI into your work. Um, it's not calculator, of course, because it's much more working in a probabilistic way meaning there's high uncertainty in its operation. Also, in many ways, they take the form of human-like uh, figure. For example, ChatGPT, why are you chatting with this agent thingy instead of giving it input and getting output, right? And also the advanced models or advanced apps are allowing you to just talk with voice and then you can hear its voice. It has voice and gender now, and also the range of job you can do is much more, much wider than calculator, right? So it's not a calculator, but my point there is that because of its powerful nature, it's gonna be used in the field and it is being used in the field now, then what are you gonna do about it? What's gonna make sense of your education if you don't integrate AI into your learning, which might, be less relevant than um, than the new version that has AI in it. So in that sense, you want to critically reflect on the value of your educational endeavor, and you're going to find the core company you must teach without using AI, and that needs to be um, assessed without AI. For example, you can monitor how they're using it in a classroom or in, in an exam session, or you can try using um, this lab note thing uh, Celeste has uh, introduced, which is a great idea, I think. Um, and also you have to distinguish that between um, against uh, uh, what, what you have to teach with uh, AI. I hope that answered the question. 
Thank you very much. And I see another question. Um, and I know. Uh, so this is a question about um, the major barriers for faculty educators in attempting to integrate AI into our curricula. And anyone unmute yourself, Kari. Um, yes, I think one of the major barriers is is what uh, freedom and flexibility we feel we have depending on our own position within the institution. So I say that as contract faculty, um, you know, I have a great contract, I'm full time, but it's still a contract faculty, not tenure track position. And so there are barriers there institutionally and in how brave we can feel and how we can see our teaching in our class rooms as spaces where we can have um, the ability to, to try things that may not result in a, a perfect project. <laughs> I mean, a lot of what we're bound by in it as, as contract faculty, non-tenure track faculty is the metric of student evaluations and student experience of instruction metrics. Um, and that that's risky for many folks to want to do things um, really differently or to want to um, make our classroom spaces uh, filled with unknowns versus knowns. So I would say that uh, fully tenured faculty are in the easiest position to both uh, take risks and embrace the tool, but also are in the easiest position to turn away and ensconce themselves in a position where they don't have to use it at all, because there's not a lot of consequence there. Whereas for lecturers, sessionals, grad students who are emerging into the academic market, uh, undergraduate students who are going into job markets where AI is everywhere, you know, entire communication teams are being now integrated with fully AI processes. Um, we just simply don't have that choice. So the the biggest barrier, I think, is institutional uh, support. Often, uh, I I will say that one of the reasons I felt so able to use the tool and to explore it is because of the incredible leadership of our current. Uh, senior Associate Dean of Students, Alicia Salzberg, who's being the one since January 1st, 2023, to really work with teachers and lecturers and students um, in this domain. Uh, and as an Associate Dean, she is also a lecturer, contract faculty. So that's an interest that, that to me is a really powerful person to have represented in a Dean's office right now. No one of you wanted to respond. Um, I wanted to just make a comment of several things sort of going on in, in the chat. Um, and that is at this stage, at least in my experience using ChatGTP for generating ideas, science writing, I've used it in a couple other um, areas as well. And I've watched my kid use it in humanities some um, and statistical analyses is that it's actually not great. It's best at statistical analyses, but the rest is kind of. Eh. So I think that um, we we sort of need to proceed with caution, I guess, about this assumption that students are just going to be able to have it create this amazing thing because it does take a lot of babysitting still. But having said that, I think this is the thing where 15 years from now, you know, obviously it's going to get better and it will be able to um, eventually um, these these. Um, AI models will be able to hopefully um, accurately cite sources, for example, um, and not be so obviously written by AI and writing things. So I think, you know, there will be improvement going on, but as it stands right now, it's, um, it's not sort of a standalone thing in my, in my experience, mostly. William, and I, I know Don would, would like to say something too, but um, Don would, so I'm just going to let you hold that and William, go ahead. I mean, I'll just 
mention my concerns about something that uh, Corey Doctorow referred to as the inspitification of the internet, except he didn't use a P, he used an H in the middle of that word. Um, so I, I'm worried about the inspitification of AI over time as people tend to rely on it more and more. It's the, I mean, it, it does partly address Dong Wook's point about how, um, when you have such a tool and it becomes so useful that everybody piles on it, it becomes almost impossible to imagine using anything else. I think I would invite everyone here to imagine how often they use Google as opposed to DuckDuckGo or some other competing search engine, right? Or how often they use Amazon or Walmart to order things compared to ordering direct from retailers. I, I think there is a danger in everyone piling onto one particular large language model and saying this is going to be the one that we use. There will be other ways to monetize it, etc. Thank you, William. Oh, I know uh, this is really a roundtable. We are getting spin into so many different directions. There's so many topics that we'd like to respond to. But I know, Don, you were going to respond to something on curricula. Um, I wanted to respond about uh, Kari and Celeste's point uh, about how AI tools going to march uh, and actually climb up the power hierarchy in educational system, uh, which which I which is totally my speculation and expectation uh, uh, speculation, which I hope would not happen, but I, it's likely to happen. And I think it's related to uh, the the colonial nature of these tools, uh, where it leverages the existing resources without a lot of consent, without proper consent. Uh, which is under um, lawsuit, I believe, um, uh, between the author institution and uh, OpenAI now. Uh, and they leverage it for a corporate uh, interest. Um, and of course, this corporate, like big tech companies, uh, as they're saying that they're using it for making this tool more accessible and usable and powerful, uh, which will enhance the productivity of society as a whole, but also there's a concern about marginalization of individuals as Carrie uh, beautifully illustrated. And one point that I wanna highlight there uh, is typically this marginalization happens from lower end of the power structure. Let's say in university, there's a whole decision makers like tenured professors and those who are you know, uh, more vulnerable positions. And then there are TAs and you know, undergrad TAs and so on. Um, and these tools, as Celeste has mentioned, they're not perfect, but they can do a pretty decent job in those tasks that human can do. And there are existing studies that show these tools can actually sometimes do better, uh, uh, like giving a superhuman performance for a certain kind of tasks. For example, if you just let it do a very mechanical or laborious task that doesn't require a lot of deep thinking, but those that you are... Um, asking your TAs to do, it may can do a great job. And as William said, if the whole structure is getting addicted to that capacity, then we may see the need of giving less job to the TA. Uh, and as, as the AI tools uh, capacity increases, what they can do in a climb up this ladder and it may can impact the, the other type of other tiers of, uh, of the workforce. So there is a real threat uh, to the actual uh, hierarchy itself. And further on, I think the other relevant aspect is the uh, threat to train. What if, if these tools are eradicating the need for TA, that these tools are so good, every, every instructor uses you know, AI TA and there's no need for TA. That's gonna do a budget cut for the university, but that's gonna remove the future uh, like academics who are excited about and uh, excited about their experiences in interacting with who they taught, right? If I remember wh why I became excited about teaching, you know, it's based based on my undergrad teaching experience. But if I don't get uh, that opportunity, then this removal of shadow learning gonna lead into the deeper problem of the work structure, I believe. 
Wow. Thank you. So much to think about. Um, Halima. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've been trying to narrow it down to just one concern and I've narrowed it down to two. <laughs> My two greatest concerns are transparency and interpret interpretability. And um, I see this big data science. So learning analytics, using machine learning algorithms to process educational data. And specifically, one of the things that I've been looking at is how people understand visualizations of data. And I think that we have, we have an issue basically in that, do people understand what they're looking at? Do they understand, especially if they're using these types of tools for uh, the interpretation of data, can they critically question the results. This is a process where we absolutely have to have humans in the loop, meaning that we lost Halima. We are going to hold a thought and then we have another. Um, William is ready to respond to a question on Slido. William, what is, can you Yes. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Judy. Yes, I, I wanted to uh, respond to the question, does generative AI highlight a conflation of knowledge and competence with communication skills and confidence, and how would that distinction be teased out? I mean, my short answer to that question is yes, I do think it highlights it, and how to tease it out, that's not very, it's not really clear how we would tease that out without a lot of intensive work uh, in, in terms of, in order to actually assess a human being's understanding of a topic, in detail, you pretty much have to interact with them one on one for an extended period of time verbally. If if you if you want to make sure there is no AI intermediary that's you know coaching them on emails and coaching them on how to write, but if you want to actually assess the understanding in someone's brain, you actually have to interact with them one on one. Even then, humans are good at gaming the system. All all one needs to do is look at recent history of uh, various CEOs who have brought products uh, uh, to, to a highly speculative nature of an investment stage. Um, and then that, then the whole thing has collapsed as a house of cards. A number of companies have gone under for exactly that reason, the conflation of people who were good and confident talkers with competence in what they were actually trying to do. Thank you for the opportunity to address that question. Hopefully the person who asks it considers my answer satisfactory. Well, all the audience, you are welcome to unmute and ask. We'd love to have the interaction, even though we have Slido, we have like, I'm on my phone looking at the Slido question and there's all this chat going on. So, but let's not forget the other way of communication. Just unmute yourself and ask. Don't be afraid. I'm not really going we are not going to spotlight you if you don't want to, and you can remain behind the camera too. Um, panelists, is there any other questions where we'd like to elaborate? Because sometimes it's hard to type in the chat. Um, this is yeah. This is an interesting one. Maybe Celeste, you uh, you put in the chat that. There was a comment, was it on Slido? Surely the biggest questions facing instructors right now are how we evaluate student work. Everything else is interesting, but not important. And you wrote, my evaluations are exactly the same. So what, what can you just clarify? I'm, I just am curious about what, yeah, so the, what that so, is. Yeah, what's going so on what in the chat there? What my student, so the structure of my course has not changed at all, other than giving about 30 minutes a couple times of the term of showing students how how to use this students that haven't haven't used AI before if they choose to. Other than that, there's been zero changes in what my students do, um, how we evaluate their work and their assessment. But I, I know that's very specific for um, my field and what I'm doing. Um, I had a comment earlier in response to something that I think uh, Jennifer McCormick that you posted around around the different 
platforms and the different outputs they produce, um, where I've really shifted in my communications courses. So I teach a first year COM 196, which is a first year writing and public speaking course for uh, first year solder students. And where I'm really going to be shifting in term two is thinking about writing in terms of the input into these spaces versus the output. So uh, prompt crafting and, and what is a prompt is, is creates a huge dif difference between what is like produced as the output. Um, but I also pose and will pose again, the question about um, voice and, I, and, and as a writer, so much of what you're doing when you're writing and I don't teach science or anything. I teach, you know, professional communication and, and creative process and writing in that domain. Um, so much of it is about writing as a process of finding voice, finding self, and, and writing your way through a, something stuck that emerges as unstuck. And and in my own academic work, writing was a research methodology. So writing my way through my my thinking was was really really important and one of the pieces that I'm curious for us to explore is like how do you find voice and identity and how you prompt and how you draft craft and draft a prompt uh what do you need to know to be able to draft a great prompt versus just cutting and pasting something you saw some tech guy on x post that's gonna like make you five million dollars <laughs> and then the other thing about it is what in 20 years, what is this tone of voice that people will be inputting into AI to emulate you? So I can right now say, okay, chat GPT, please write my shopping list in the tone of Sylvia Plath or in the voice of Bell Hooks. Like I can, and it can do this amazing stuff with my shopping list that is truly quite beautiful. But my students are the future bell hooks and Sylvia Plath. So how do I, as a writing instructor, work with them to continue to find identity and voice in their writing so that we're not, we're not going to be filled with just a lot of um, canon that ends in 2023. William and Salis. If I may, I'd, I'd like to speak a bit to the issue of trust that uh, Dr. Dr. Markin uh, raised. I invite everyone to consider why you believe what you believe, like the beliefs that you walk around with in your head, your value systems. Generally, I would argue you believe them because they've come to you from some type of source that you trust, whether it's parents, cultural background, other members of the university, etc. Now, when one reads a chunk of text, there is an implicit assertion of value that that text is making. Now that may come from a human who wrote the text or a group of humans who put that text together, like say clinical practice guidelines on a particular disease. But if it's, if it's coming simply from sampling everything that's out there and basically producing an average, I, I'm also concerned about the, the drift towards average and, and the ability of people to game that system. So I'll, I'll, I'll invite folks to consider that. I don't have a specific answer for it. If I can comment on the issue of trust, that I think uh, trust should come from um, in inclusively this assessment context in education. Uh, it should come from those who bear the responsibility of what they're offering. Uh, it can be the writer who is using ChatGPT might have used ChatGPT or it can be a student. Uh, they, so that's why AI literacy education is impor important. It's not just about how to use AI, but about what it comes with AI use, such as that uh, the user bears the ultimate responsibility. These are tools, uh, though they're super tools. And the trust should arise from, um, and and between the relationship uh, between those involved, including instructor and student in the educational context. Uh, so that's the comment that I want to make. Thank you, Don. So let's, I saw that you unmute yourself for a very brief moment. Oh, I don't know why I forgot. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, I think I I think I'd already I'm responding in in the chat to comments, and I think it was one of those that I'd already commented on. Thank you very much. This is so much going on. Um, still, still looking at the chat and looking at my phone, the Slido question. We still have one question on top of the Slido list. Um, that has five upvote. If AI is allowed or even encouraged to be used in students' learning, will it deprive students of learning opportunity to enhance their mind development? I do have question about what mind development means, but will seems like you. I mean, I'll, I'll go with yes on that one, um, but I'll, I'll modify it so as not to be so dogmatic. Again, if if coached appropriately on how the tool works and what the actual output is, namely sampling of the average that's out there, um, one could produce students who understand how to use uh, generative AI to produce better product. I don't know that you could use generative AI to produce better understanding other, in, other than in some kind of meta sense, pardon the, pardon the pun. Um, but, you know, understanding is intrinsically difficult to assess. I mean, there's been a couple of other questions in the chat about that. Very hard to do other than one on one. I mean, you know, full disclosure, almost all of the evaluation that I do of students and learners such as uh, residents who are, are training to be specialists is is low throughput it's it's one on one very very difficult to do at a at a at scale um, I, I haven't solved that problem of how to do it at scale I, I invite comments from the others um if i comment about that uh, i think we are talking about very old notion of constructive uh, concept of learning where the learning happens inside uh, not about just a behavior measure. So uh, yes, there's a risk. Uh, if students depends on using AI, then they can um, lose the inner ability. And that's why I believe AI invariant or AI independent learning uh, is important and it must be assessed uh, without using AI. But also, if I can take a little more progressive or adventurous stance, I hope you can also think about the metaphor of people using computers these days or search engines, then um, one might say in 80s education, oh, that's a cheating and you're not using your own um, ability to go to the library and then identify what's relevant. You're just typing in this keyword and then you're just copying and pasting everything. That's what's coming up on the website, right? So uh, the, the point that I'm making here is of course, uh, Gen AI is not exactly the same as the, the internet, um, but if you wanna assess somebody's capacity, then you should identify the context you wanna evaluate their, ident uh, their capacity on. Meaning, do you wanna assess like single human without having any tool? Or do you wanna, do you wanna evaluate somebody who is using the tool um, and I think that's going to be the fundamental question of education. I think Hannah. this also speaks to how, yes, <laughs> I think this also speaks to how we handle uncertainty. And I think that's something we should be asking our students to do is what's your certainty in your answer? What is that built on? And then that goes back to what William was saying about uh, the criticality that we're employing of, do we trust this data? Where does it come from? Um, do we trust this response? Do we have some kind of feeling that it's it's that, that unsettling feeling where we don't quite trust? And then this goes back to what Carrie was saying. Do we trust what's there? And if we don't, let's explore that. Let's help students build that tacit knowledge where they are building their expertise and they're developing trust in themselves. And I think that that's something that maybe these generative AI uh, models, it's has given us the opportunity to add some things to the way that we assess student work. And I apologize for cutting off earlier. I found myself talking to a black screen. <laughs> So I don't know at what point my computer died, but so sorry about that.
I think Skynet doesn't like what you're saying, Halima. That's the that's the problem. Exactly. Never had that happen before. <laughs> Could I take like two minutes? And um, I've had several people write privately and ask specifically about how um, how to address this with student, how I address this with students before they're off to the races in my class. Um, so I I just want to take like a minute or two and. It's very simple. So what I do, I've done this both semesters, the very first day is I share my screen and I put a prompt in that's tangential to, but not super specific about what we're doing in class. We study salmon. So it's around salmon and the importance in the ecosystem. And I ask it to write like two paragraphs or something. And then I just let the students sit and read it and comment on what, what they think it's done good and what even day one, what they notice that it's done bad. So they have a list right away of, they know immediately that it is super repetitive. It's very superficial, all this stuff. Um, and then usually someone asks, notices that it doesn't provide references automatically. So then we ask it to give us some references and then they spend a few minutes and realize that half the references are made up or don't say what they think it's gonna say. Um, so it's pretty, it's a pretty easy and pretty simple thing within like 30 minutes, they they're set to go at least for my class and can, and, and know the critical things to watch out for. Thanks for that. For sharing this private message. Yes, Carly. Can I just add something about the question about um, student learning that, that we're, we're building on. So one of the thoughts that I've had is, is um, drawing on the, the universal design for learning literature about how these tools can be both enhancing accessibility and equity and learning process in our rooms, in our classrooms, while simultaneously reinforcing systemic bias and uh, systemic oppression within its uh, drawing from particular data sets. So I try to tease out the two. I try to look at the, the data that it's drawing from as one particular piece that I interact with critically. I reflect on critically as an educator. I try to connect to the critical pedagogies that I'm steeped in and really think about the AI's outputs and its privacy and all of those pieces and the ethics of it um, as a piece of work that I need to continually critically engaging in. But as a tool, as, as a pedagogical tool, it also attends to many of these systemic biases and oppressions in how it creates ease for many folks in the system who have not had ease. So it can create spaces where um, students who are neurodivergent or who have English as additional language, there are ways that it just has created in my classroom a very quick um, leveling of, of confidence where we can use this tool to help with editing, help with revising, help with creating a really well-designed PowerPoint for a public speaking presentation. Um, and these things are not taking all of the creative and generative energy of my students, especially those who have found the real detail-orientedness of scholarly work to be a real barrier in their ability to, to launch. So I find myself torn. I find myself very torn and I can't, say, oh, because of this, I'm not going to use it because some of those same issues apply here. Uh, and I've had interesting conversations with, with students who have, so I, I had a student once demand that we not use it at all in class because of all the ethical and, and biases and issues in the data set. And then I said, yeah, but I'm also thinking about this pedagogically. And there are ways that this really has created um, equity and reduced harm in the education system for some of the students in this class who find there to be quite a few barriers and for faculty. So I've, in many ways, it's really 
just to name, it's really helped me. It's really helped me in terms of creating uh, a leveling of certain pieces of the this, this scholarly process that, that have been really challenging for me. I think it's Alexa. helpful to consider ourselves all beta testers in a system that's not quite final. So if we take that perspective, you're a beta tester, you're going to find bugs, you're going to possibly break the system, uh, that it's, it's a much more secure place to come from. I have a comment about uh, both uh, point made by Akari and Halimad about this notion of beta testing. Um, I wonder if you heard about the notion of permanently beta, which has become a norm in these days tools, mm -hmm. where every tool that you use in online is beta testing, and you are actually both a user and the product. You are the product if you are not paying for it. Um, and that's the same for these tools as well. And and why? Because they're using your data to train better system and advancing it, making more powerful to garner more users, right? So you're in, in a sense, no more a user, you're a UZ in that sense. Um, in education, uh, let's talk about the UBC context. CTLT is a blessing to UBC, I believe. We have so many competent researchers and officers they are working to enhance technical support for UBC classes. And I, I, I think I heard they're working on it, but one thing that I really is important to embrace AI into UBC education for uh, the benefit Carrie mentioned, such as accessibility and better learning and level in the field. It is the UBC version of LLM, like language model we, we, have, we can use consistently. Uh, why? because of the model variability of the performance and also pay options. Um, if I don't know whether you have used GPT-3 compared to GPT-4, GPT-4 is a paid version where you're gonna pay $20 USD and uh, you can get a better performance. Actually, the, the performance difference between GPT-3 and 4, the free version, the paid version is like word difference, right? It's like seeing an essay, if, if you're gonna let it do your, your uh, assignment, it's, it's like seeing an A zero to A minus student versus uh, maybe C uh, students, C to B students. Um, so if you if we do want to level the play field, then we need to let us use the consistent uh, length model like ChatGPT or Ch you can say ChatUBC. Uh, and we have to offer it as part of educational infrastructure. And that's going to be a lot of investment um, the other reason why we have to have our own language model is because of the privacy concerns. If we just let them use these, like open AI models, I mean, all the data are crossing the, the uh, border and it's a FIFA violation. So uh, in order to stick to the university policy, actually, in order to officially embrace language model, the instructor should designate them a Canadian language model they can use. Um, otherwise, you know, who knows what they're gonna put in, which kind of data. Um, so I think uh, we we have to work on it. I think I heard uh, there is a committee, Gen AI committee uh, at UBC, they're working on it too. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have any information about uh, specific progress that they're making right now, but I'm hopeful that they're gonna do because they have to do to thrive in the, next AI embedded education domain. I hate to cut this off, but we are 10 minutes to 11 and we all need a break. We started off with a very um, welcoming welcome from Elisa, um, looking at the four level of Gen AI in our life, in our society. I really, really want to listen to your comments on the next upcoming questions on Slido. I'm like, how are we going to evaluate students' understanding of Gen AI when I don't even know what Gen AI is myself? And I think there's so much that I would like to talk about too. Like, and then the students, can we really beta test on our students when the grade will stay on the transcript forever? 
there's so many questions, but I would like to take the last minute to thank you, our panelists, um, the time, um, the welcome gesture every time when I email them, ask them to, to, to get the input. And we had a meeting last week. Thank you very much for sharing all of your knowledge and what, what you know about what's happening around you in your discipline. Thank you very much. Thank you.